My name is Jonathan Appel, and I was brought in to take a look at this historic tomb that had been placed on the floor, embedded into concrete since the early 1900s. Um, it all started with an email that was sent to me, and um, I followed up on that. And as soon as I heard it was at Jamestown, I became very interested because um, everyone's heard of Jamestown. So um, I uh, went back and forth and fortunately was able to schedule a quick visit here in person. I was able to come in and take a look at this uh, beautiful tomb and study it pretty closely. And what I thought was going to be a quick visit ended up being a uh, hour plus uh, discussion about how we could deal with uh, with freeing it from the concrete and, and moving it and uh, then conserving it. So we started here uh, yesterday morning uh, trying to free this tomb from the uh, cement it was set in. There was very hard Portland cement uh, colored darkly along the top edge, kind of acting as a uh, protective skirt around it. Now Portland cement became very common and very widely used material in the early 1900s. And unfortunately, it was used in many different ways, incorporated into historic materials. A great number of historic buildings have been detrimentally affected by Portland cement being combined with historic building materials that are much more, um, that are softer, that are more porous, that have different um, characteristics. And so the, 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 they really shouldn't be combined. I was able to grind it free from that um, concrete and then chisel under it and uh, fortunately they did us a great service by not embedding the entire uh, slab into wet hard Portland cement based mortar instead they set it on shims on a brick pedestal and uh, slate shims and then a lime mortar was used so um, it actually came out pretty easily once it was, um, once the concrete, the hard uh, Portland cement based material was removed. It had been previously broken according to a picture from 1905, a photograph, uh, or a series of photographs fortunately were recovered. And so once all the cement was removed around the edge and underneath, hand chiseled carefully, uh, I was able to pry away um, individual fragments one at a time and remove them um, from the, uh, the original setting. And so we put them on this adapted um, kind of utility uh, trailer. I created a platform and, um, and then we raised it uh, by tipping it and putting it on the platform and then getting planks under it and then using rollers, um, kind of very simple version of something we know at least the Egyptians used that far back um, to basically pu push it up a ramp and uh, with the help of uh, a handful of strong individuals, uh, got it safely onto the platform without incident, and um, we're all happy it's, it's resting nicely here, um, awaiting conservation. The next step is gonna be to actually prepare each piece to get them ready to be uh, joined together again so it can you know, look like it did you know, originally, basically, in its shape and everything. And so in order to do so, we're gonna have to um, clean all the mating surfaces on the stone. Along the edges, there's a lot of residue and old Portland cement repair material. We also uncovered some paper material that was under the surface, and it appears that they used that to to create a dam and then pour liquid Portland cement pigmented into the joints um, in order to use as infill and to close the joints cosmetically. Uh, one of the defining things about it is there's no inscription on it because all of the uh, lettering was inlaid in metal and unfortunately lost. So um, makes it very unusual having no inscription that could even be read under close analysis. So we could only theorize based on the archaeology and things that are found here on the site. And that's what this is all about. It's about the archaeology that's happening and that the finds that are being uncovered. And so that was the driving force to move this tomb from its uh, location that it had been placed in in about 1905 so that they can dig under it. And so um, it'll be interesting to see what is uncovered once the dig begins and uh, these things take a lot of time and patience and uh, it'll be 
Exciting to see what's underneath. The first thing that I noticed as soon as I brushed the dust off is the, how incredibly beautiful the stone is. It still has a radiance to it, and you can see, especially coming with the natural light coming through the windows, um, you know, reflecting the light, it still actually has a polish on it. And that's after, um, you know, hundreds of years and uh, multiple events, and the structure has uh, burned down and then was reconstructed. The stone itself is in amazing condition. So the age of this is unknown because the inscription is missing, but it can be theorized and maybe as more archaeology is done, um, they'll have a better understanding um, of who this might be, but if it was um, possibly one of the original founders, George Yardley, who um, passed away in 1627, um, clearly that would be by far the oldest colonial gravestone in America. And most of the earlier stones were not nearly as elaborate, and I have never seen anything with extensive metalwork from the 1600s, ever, anywhere.